question really is, is how do we do this? So how do we enter the sector? How do we actually enter the sector in practice? Because um, we know Great British Nuclear is coming. We know that um, the UK is investing heavily in nuclear and we know there's going to be a lot of opportunities out there. So I'd like to talk about how you can do it. And I feel I'm pretty well placed to do that, having worked in both the nuclear sector, oil and gas sector and other industrial sectors, which have a lot of focus on um, safety. So Okay, so I'm going to give you a commercial overview of the entire sector and the practice and the approaches that are used, the opportunities that exist and the lessons that I suppose to have sued have learned through working in the sector and through supporting lots of different programmes. Okay, so within the UK, we know the sector is going to expand a lot. It's been in the newspaper as recently we've seen it on the TV. We know there are big sort of geopolitical reasons why um, energy has become very significant um, recently. So currently, we're looking at a minimum of three major units in the UK. So there's a three big plants, a bit like, say, Hinkley Point C, with a minimum of one SMR. So that's a small modular reactor. Hopefully, there'll be more than one small modular reactor, and hopefully, there should be many more than that internationally. But that's a minimum at the moment. So the big drivers uh, for, uh, for this are really energy. Energy security, energy security, levelized cost of supply, uh, generation of a carbon neutral base load, which of course is key to the expansion of other green technologies such as electric vehicles and of course the hydrogen economy. So at present, the estimated market value for the UK sector is around about 75 billion, uh, certainly with overlapping projects. And this is very significant with regard to the existing supply capacity, and we believe will fuel the need for more suppliers. So in general terms, the sector's big and the sector's going to expand with around 443 operational reactors over around about 30 different countries. Uh, nuclear generates about 20% of global power. And the consensus across major international studies is that low carbon sources like nuclear need to be deployed urgently and at large scale. So medium projection is that we need to more than double our current nuclear output by 2050 in order to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. So new technology will be required, and if you're able to make designers aware of your new or alternative products, they can be included from the outset, and they may possibly influence the direction of the designs. So definitely new processes, new products, and new solutions. So barriers to entry. So there's a lot of people out there that make high integrity component parts that would definitely find a market in the nuclear sector, but they seem to perceive there's a bit of a barrier to entry or there's a barrier to sector transition. Um, either feeling the entry is difficult, or perhaps historically they've tried and failed to enter the sector, so they don't wish to try again. And crucially, a lot of firms don't even realise there's a market for their components in the nuclear sector. So what are the main problems that people face? So I think if we run through the slide, finding opportunities, stroke determining that your products are needed is the first stumbling block. Following on from that, instilling confidence in the site license holder that you can transfer sector. And then evidencing the products or evidencing the fact that the products you make are durable and suitable for a nuclear environment. So those kind of melt down to the two main points at the bottom. Um, first of which is evidencing organisational quality, which is ISO 19443. So get that under your belt, get that sorted pretty early on, because uh, that's one of the key things that anybody in the nuclear sector would look for. And then following on from that is complying with industry regulations um, or qualifying the equipment for the specific applications needed. <laughs> and that's generally referred to as qualification. So the good news is that entering the sector may not be as complex as you think, and there are people who can help. So if I talk about the slide that we've just got up at the screen at the moment, so this shows a, it's a sweeping generalisation. Um, it, it's not focused on a particular plant design, and it's an effective high-level illustration of general safety class distribution aligned through the complexity of certification or qualification. So a lot of the components in a nuclear plant are not in the nuclear island, so they're not under the concrete dome. Uh, they're not irradiated, uh, so these components basically are very similar to the petrochemical or oil and gas component parts. And there are a lot of parts in the conventional island which have origins, uh, you know, such as valve sensors, power transformers, and electrical parts, which have origins from the mainstream sector. So those are illustrated in blue. So we've got our reactor, whatever type of reactor it is, 
on the left hand side and then we've got our turbine horse rate generator outfit on the right hand side and all the component parts in there are non-classified and they are conventional industrial component parts so you can immediately enter the sector if you manufacture component parts like that so a significant amount of the equipment within the plant is non-classified um, so it's actually relatively easy to supply straight into a nuclear product and uh, into a nuclear project so of the equipment that really does require certification or qualification, seismic, which is the line which is in orange there, kind of is almost a universal baseline requirement. But increasingly, that can be addressed by analysis. And at Tufsud, we've got had EQ files certifying seismic performance by analysis accepted on nuclear new builds within the last couple of years. Uh, so seismic requirements are not necessarily that expensive or time consuming to address. But seismic requirements or evidencing seismic resilience is pretty much a baseline requirement for most of the uh, components with the higher safety classifications. So most challenging nuclear accident conditions only apply to a fraction of components found in plant, primarily those on the left hand side of the slide, which are result located within containment. So those will be under the, the red squares there, uh, safety function one, two or three. But the key message is that for most equipment, qualification is probably less demanding in functional terms, you may think. Uh, specifically for say SFC3, which contributes a sizable proportion of the equipment in plant. So for lower safety classes, evidence is based largely on good quality traceable industrial records. And we've recent experience of doing this for COTS items to the satisfaction of the UK regulator. So if your products are produced to ISO standards of quality and traceability, you're well on the way to meeting the requirements for less challenging safety classes, which will be illustrated to the right hand side of this, um, this illustration or potentially SFC3. So the key thing is that every station, I think, is going to have a non-nuclear conventional island. So whether the reactor is a fission reactor or whether it's a fusion reactor, the market for these component parts is going to be very large. However, the non-classified environments may be less aggressive, but the reliability and obviously the evidence required does not reduce the safety classification. So the key point, I think, when we draw that slide to a close is that there's a lot of non-qualified, non-classified equipment, which is going to be very, very similar to oil and gas, aerospace, other component parts. It's not going to be irradiated. Um, of the equipment that is, there are, a number of different ways that you can approach that and we're very experienced in delivering those files. So what's next? I mean what sectors do we think could transition? So shown above are some of the sectors that we support um, and in our opinion we feel of comparable focus on reliability and integrity and from our experience may contain translator equipment suitable for nuclear applications. So the focus on safety and reliability and integrity is not specific to the nuclear sector. And at TUV, our experience straddles many sectors. So the TUV stamp appears on lots of different products in lots of different industry sectors. So we have a good overview and we have good reason to think this is the case. So crucially, numerous other sectors have similar requirements uh, or similar focus, such as green energy, offshore energy, aerospace, um, oil and gas, medical and rail, and some of those are kind of illustrated up there. So we know there are definitely other sectors out there that have you know, comparable products, comparable focus, and they can certainly find a market. So in our recent experience, we believe cross-sector applications exist for many technology types. So above our examples, the types that we've had certified and that we believe may feature in numerous nuclear plant designs. So general examples include uh, ruggedized cables, stroke umbilicals to carry signal, comms, power, fluid, uh, which have to be resistant to extremes of temperature and pressure. Uh, telecom systems, control room architectures derived from, say, defense or maritime applications, specialized centrifugal or reciprocating pumps. These are used in a lot of station designs uh, and they can sometimes be problematic so new designs of those are always looked for. Uh, motorized actuated valve systems of numerous different types and sizes. Uh, those are used extensively in cooling circuits and often the components have their origin in the oil and gas industry. Um, I think finally in the bottom right hand corner we think an interesting extension this would be say qualified thermoelectric Peltier modules for local applications say maybe where you get uh, inadequacies in say an HVAC system. So based on our knowledge of the sector and based on the work that we've done we think there are a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of equipment that could move sector. So we know we're an expanding sector and we know we need for more breadth and depth of supply base because we've got lots of projects potentially moving forward in parallel. And crucially, we know that we need new solutions to problems. Um, and I think the interesting thing here is that history tells us that solutions to one sector's requirements may exist in another sector. Uh, and the example on the screen is technology migrating from the aerospace sector to provide a state-of-the-art solution to an automotive problem. 
Uh, it's a slightly older example, but it's still very relevant. Um, I think a more recent example would be the adoption of, say, multiplexed wiring systems by offshore oil and gas operators using networks of, say, CAN bus, mod bus sensors as per automotive practice. Um, and in fact, sometimes coupled to acoustic flow sensors that have their origins in, say, medical applications. So we know quite a lot about that. We know about the automotive networks from TV um, work that we do with the automotive sector, and we know about the oil and gas offshore things. And there are distinct translatory um, aspects to those two. And history tells us that when technology changes sector, it's often for the benefit of both the sectors concerned. It's when you increase the commonality, you have a larger market to offset the development costs against. And that's one of the interesting things that we see from a TV perspective, is we don't just provide laboratory services and we don't just work in the nuclear sector. So our key observation as a group <clears throat> is that involvement in all the sectors shown is that the key thing that seems to stop technology crossing into the nuclear sector is qualification and it's the perceived complexities of it. It really is the barrier to entry. People look at it and they think, well, yeah, you know, we could supply our sensors, valves, motors into the nuclear sector, but the rules and regulations are just so complicated that we don't really want to look at it. And I think if we can improve that situation and mutually benefit the nuclear sector or have greater choice of suppliers, and the site license holders will be able to deliver quicker using pre-qualified components. So I suppose Having got this far, the question then is, well, how do you qualify the equipment? How do you actually jump that key hurdle that stops people getting access to the sector, getting access to you know, what's going to be a burgeoning sector in the UK with the foundation of Great British Nuclear? Um, so in my opinion, I'd say you approach us as a group and you, you start a conversation with Tuff Sued. Um, but fundamentally, there are three main approaches that we would suggest that a supplier uh, pursue based on the nature of the product they've got and based on exactly um, what they're trying to do with it. So the first of which um, would be test. So it would be taking a product that already exists, taking a product that you manufacture, whether it's a cable, an actuator, a valve, or a motor, and thinking about what it actually needs to see when it's in service in the nuclear station and actually simulating that in practical terms, writing the necessary lab reports, documentation, and then actually evidencing the fact that it does what it needs to do and providing that documentary evidence by test. So we do a test-based approach where you really can't use any analysis, either because the environment can't readily be simulated or because the technology is new and it's not readily understood or it's just too hard to model. And we often find that suppliers may already, for instance, have FAT data, and they often ask if specific ETUs tests are necessary. The problem with the FAT data is it doesn't tend to simulate the nuclear conditions. It tends to be a pass-fail criteria, um, just based on whatever its normal sort of operating conditions are. So we've got a few pictures on the screen. Um, in short, we're the largest laboratory group in Europe, and we have most of the capability we need under our own roof. So I won't go into the fine detail of exactly what we have, but most qualifications for most nuclear stations can be completed without the specimens leaving our group, and often without them leaving a specific laboratory. So if I leave my presentation here, and I hand over to my colleague Jack, who's an expert in the, the test um, side of things, he can give you greater detail in exactly what we can offer uh, from the test side. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Graham said, I'm Jack Tuckwell. Uh, I am the internal sales executive here at Octagon House in Fairham. So this is where our main site is. Um, so we have Core UK services here, um, obviously at some of the other sites in the UK as well, um, which cover many of the different uh, items that are listed down on this well, the suite of tests that are here. We, we're going to go through a few of those as we go through my following slides, but just an overview. We've got environmental EMC, which is electromagnetic compatibility, which is where my main background is. Product safety, machinery safety, medical and health services. Obviously, some of these components will be used or could be used in a, in a medical environment also. Radio and telecommunications, um, we are, as obviously part of Graham, we have the certificate and auditing side of the business, uh, as along with consulting. Um, we have training courses and things like today, webinars. So starting in environmental, uh, this is our, our laboratory here in Fairham has some very large bespoke facilities, um, which is a real USP for us is obviously the size of our chambers. Our chambers span five meters wide, six meters deep, and up to four meters high. And that is our largest chamber, which is a real uh, selling point for a lot of components that are gonna go into some of these environments that you may be looking to, to market for. Um, 
what many of you will probably be aware is obviously of CE marking, UK CA marking and, and similar for your products themselves. To move into uh, the, the nuclear side of the industry, obviously you're gonna look at topping those up. So you're gonna have your product standards and what we're gonna now need to do is to go to more of the environment that you're gonna be uh, marketing these into, which obviously is where Graham was talking earlier about the different uh, cases and locations within uh, the, the, the environment of a nuclear power station, for example. These kind of environments have higher temperature and humidity ratings than what you would normally see in a commercial or industrial environment. So we can go through the temperature and humidity test, altitude if applicable, uh, ice ingress, as you can see, there's a nice picture of uh, icing of uh, some isolators from a um, some power lines. We do ingress protection. It's really important for ingress protection. Some people kind of miss this one off. Um, if there were an event at uh, a site and say the sprinkler system went off, you wanna make sure uh, that your unit is IP protected so that there is no water ingress when the sprinkler system goes off and will continually operate as intended, or if it was outside and so on and so forth. We have IK testing, which is uh, kind of an add-on to ingress, which is vandal proof testing. We wanna make sure that if there was an event that somebody Let's just use an example of drive a forklift into, into a component or hit something unnecessarily. It wouldn't cause a catastrophic failure because there's a dent in the front of the cabinet. It would continue to operate as it should. We have a mechanical vibration and shock facility. We have uh, six now electrodynamic shakers, uh, which vary in different sizes, uh, up to 240 kilonewtons, I believe. Uh, these can, uh, can enable us to do uni axial testing, which is then link into what Graham said earlier about the seismic analysis. By doing this single axis testing, it enables us to use the FEA modeling to then give you the seismic qualification without having to go on to further testing. And finally, on this slide, we have packaging. You wanna make sure that your product gets to your customer safe and sound and that it is gonna be operational. If you are gonna ship it overseas, Obviously, you want to take into consideration it being on a, on a boat for a long period of time, or if you're going to fly it. Well, we've had things recently that they, need, they needed to fly a sensor, um, and because of it going in the holes, you need to make sure it will handle altitude, make sure it handle decompression when it comes back down from altitude, and then still operate when it gets to the other side. So EMC, this is my kind of bread and butter. We have 14 screen enclosures here at Fairham. Um, as you can see, the sizes there, they vary in sizes. With a lot of the standards that you will probably have seen, um, many of you will have experienced EMC testing through your CE journey if you've gone down that route. Um, we're going to go through a more enhanced process when we look at qualification. The emissions profiles may be more stringent because of the environments, the frequency ranges will be wider. Uh, in our facilities, we can go all the way down to 9 kilohertz and all the way up to 40 gigahertz. And by the end of Q1 this year, it will be well into the hundreds of gigahertz with new technology that we are developing in-house. From an immunity perspective, a lot of products have an industrial uh, approach to them. With nuclear applications, 61006-5 is a standard which is for power station environments. Those levels are enhanced. At the end of the day, you wanna make sure that your product still operates in its environment that it's gonna be used in. And that's what these standards are therefore designed to test your unit to. So we can carry out those tests at those enhanced levels and carry out all of the bespoke tests that are associated with them. We have uh, a 10 meter open air test site available. This is for really, really large products. And obviously what we can also do is we can come to site. If your product is too large to be able to fit within one of our facilities, we can come to you. We can carry out uh, an offsite assessment where we can look at the noise or emissions that are coming off of your device to ensure that they will continue, they will not interfere with anything else in their environment and everything else will continually operate as intended. And we can also perform some susceptibility tests to ensure that your unit does not get interfered by the environment that it's going to be placed into. With our defense side of the business, we have a real uh, USP here again. Um, we can do power supply conditioning, transient and lightning simulation testing. This is an indirect lightning test to, to simulate indirect lightning, so coupling onto cables. And what we can do is we can simulate that using some of our bespoke test equipment and help through that process. 
We have product safety. Uh, product safety is a big part of, of CE and UKCA style testing. Obviously, to be able to get the products on the market, you will need to consider these. Some of these levels may need to be adjusted. You may need to just check components to ensure that they all have the correct uh, certification to be able to use into the different environments that you may be looking to uh, tailor off into with the help of Graham and the team. Um, things like this is, is put them into fault conditions. We're making sure that when we reverse polarities, when we vary voltages, that there is no adverse effects that are caused, especially when we're talking about high voltage equipment. Radio and telecommunications, if I can get my words out today. Um, a lot of products now are becoming, uh, they're having radios in them. Many years ago, uh, a radio was a mobile phone or something similar. Now, everything is having some form of tech installed into it. Remote monitoring systems uh, and such like. We have a very, very large radio department here. We can carry out testing on mobile cellular bands. We can carry out Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, and many more different technologies, Zigbee, just to be a few of them. We can also do the GPS of logistics to make sure obviously different pieces of equipment are kept in the right zoning. Obviously, we have the understanding of the technology itself. By having the understanding of the technology, we can help you apply that test to your product that's going to be used in a different environment. So when we're putting uh, different susceptibility criteria and things like that, we're making sure that your product will continue to operate as intended and we're monitoring it in the correct way. We do a test called specific absorption rate. Uh, so everyone knows it as SAR. Again, if you have a radio device, I'm sure you're already aware of this uh, requirement. We can carry that out on site here. We can also carry out off-site uh, assessments to ensure that uh, there are no, uh, like, like uh, I can't think of the word now, it's not going to come out, <laughs> occupational health limits. So we can carry out uh, EMF surveys and things like that uh, alongside the SAR requirements. Um, and as it says, compile technical files and give you certification to help for global markets. When we're talking global markets, um, Obviously, when you're looking to go through your journey of, of getting into Great British Nuclear, it's not just about Great British Nuclear, it is where else can you sell your product afterwards? By ticking through the correct boxes, you may be able to extend that out further to, to different sites around the world. Uh, we also have a machinery division. Uh, they are uh, a site-based team. Um, they work all over the country. Uh, they're, they're there to ensure the machinery safety legislation is, is covered whether it be your device itself or product, but also your factory, your production line. We can ensure that you meet all the correct requirements that are there. Um, we can give you guidance on technical files. Uh, we can carry out CE audits uh, and many of the above. I'm gonna hand you back over to Graham now. Um, that's kind of a, a broad overview of the test side of things. Graham will now go into a bit more about the analysis function that we can go through. Thank you, Jack. That was great. So I think you very clearly um, explained what we can offer in test terms. So absolutely, if you want to enter the nuclear sector, if you want to be part of uh, Great British Nuclear, you can absolutely submit items to us and we can test them and we can investigate their behaviour under a series, series of simulated um, environments, which simulate the environments that the, the equipment will see in plant, and not only in the UK, but also in line with um, other yeah, international standards. So that's absolutely the first approach that people would do, is they look to generate test data to prove that the equipment does what's needed in the nuclear sector and complies with the necessary legislation. And obviously there's a number of international codes that may need to be complied with. I haven't got time to talk about them in detail here, but we are conversant with them and uh, we, we certainly write files in line with those on a regular basis. So test is definitely the main approach that people tend to think of. So what would we do if we weren't going to test? Well, the second most common approach would be to use some sort of analysis. Um, 
And it's often the most a flexible approach. So we're at the cutting edge of product analysis and modeling, not only in nuclear, but also in other sectors, such as consumer products, where you'll often see the two UV mark applied. And um, we've an accomplished in-house team of analysts and programmers who are conversant with using the most up-to-date software. Crucially, uh, these are used broadly within the group across aerospace and medical and automotive. So we can model the performance of an awful lot of things. The key advantage to qualifying by analysis uh, for the nuclear sector is that once a model has been generated, it can be updated and adjusted and boundary conditions moved. And this means it's a good way to protect yourself and the program and its time scales against potentially fluid customer requirements. So if you want to supply component parts to a company that, for instance, is developing a new type of SMR or, for instance, is developing a new type of conventional reactor, and they're not entirely sure what the parameters are that you've got to qualify against by building a model Model, then actually you're kind of protecting yourself a little bit because you can probably shift the parameters a little bit and you probably do some retrospective analysis. So analysis is definitely a good way of going if what you're looking at is something that will actually lend itself well to analysis and if the product itself has parameters that are readily understood and easy to model. So generally speaking, analysis is a good way of going, but there are some things that are just too complex and too fiddly and we have to go back to first principles and do a test. It's just unavoidable. But occasionally we can do a test augmented by an analysis. So we can actually do a series of isolated specimen tests to generate data to feed into the model. So there's a number of different ways we can approach this. But certainly analysis is often the second most commonly um, encountered approach to a qualification for the nuclear sector. And it's something we're very conversant with. So we talked about test. We talked about analysis. There is uh, another um, philosophy that's sometimes applied uh, and sometimes used. And that's mainly analogy. So if you were in sector some time ago, if you supplied, for instance, one of the legacy stations in the UK or Europe, and you have legacy products that were qualified, you may have less work to do. So due to the challenge of finding suitable images of appropriate nuclear equipment, I've illustrated the analogies here using images of cars and bicycles and other products, but the logic's the same. If you have a product that forms part of a progressive evolutionary design series with small changes between each generation, you may be able to reuse some of your previous work. So with the cars, for instance, the series started in the 1940s and with small incremental changes finished production in the 1990s. And it's likely that if you were asked to qualify the 1980s model, a significant amount of the data that you generate in the 1970s could be used. So that would be a legitimate um, situation where potentially you could use an analogy. With the bicycles, however, clearly they both have two wheels and they both have a saddle and a pair of handlebars, but that's where the similarities end. So if we were presented with a situation like this by a customer, we'd have to advise them that an analogy wasn't appropriate and that a new analysis or test programme would be needed. So the key thing is that a previous version of your product was qualified. If you were previously in the nuclear sector or other products in your range were qualified some time ago, you might not have to go back to square one. And we're very experienced in this aspect of qualification, as in Germany, TUV sued are the regulatory body. So we regularly construct complex multi-legged arguments to address justifications similar to the ones that are illustrated above. So those are the three main approaches to qualification, test, analysis, and analogy. So if you have a manuf if you manufacture one of the product groups um, shown above, you've probably got a market in the nuclear sector, and I think we could probably definitely help you um, enter it. So test analysis analogy are the three main approaches, and certainly analogy is something that may be useful to you if you were previously in the sector some time ago. It tends to apply more to smaller component parts than the larger systems. So we get a lot of seals, gaskets, um, more simplistic components, where, for instance, there's an incremental change in design. But certainly with larger units, if, for instance, you had a motor that was qualified, say, 20 years ago, and the design has changed only incrementally, we know how, then certainly we could look at reusing some of that um, existing work and an analogy could be drawn. And that can substantially reduce the risk and the complexity of qualification. So hopefully that's um, been useful. And hopefully that's given you a sort of more positive feeling as to uh, entering the sector and the practicalities of it. I mean, some final thoughts, I think, from our position uh, with involvement in lots of sectors, we're, we're well placed to guide you through a transition into the nuclear sector. And we do feel the nuclear sector needs greater breadth and depth of supplies. So we would strongly encourage you to consider qualification of your products for nuclear applications and certainly investigate 19443 fit for nuclear, um, which would give you a good grounding in the requirements that you need to comply with. So if you're interested, definitely speak to the NIA, the Nuclear Industry Association, um, or speak with us and um, speak to have sued. And our contact details should be on the next slide. So 
myself or Jack would be very happy uh, to respond to any emails if you have any inquiries. Um, and we would obviously try and respond to you as quickly as possible. So, Amelia, um, do we have any questions well, that come in? We do have a few questions that have come in and please submit um, your questions if you do have any more for us as well. Um, Graham and Jack, that was fantastic, well done. I'm sure everybody at home has had a fantastic time. But for the questions that we've got, we have, we would like to enter the sector and would probably require a test programme for our products. What happens if they fail the required tests? Mm. You happy for okay. me to go, Graham? I can understand there's some anxiety. Oh, sorry, absolutely. Jack, if you want to answer that one, far, yeah, far away. So from a testing perspective, uh, a lot of people, we, we're going to go on a journey with you is probably the best way of kind of putting it. If you had experienced a failure during any of the tests, we can try and highlight where those issues are. Um, we, we, we can't necessarily advise you uh, from a consultancy perspective of while we're doing the test, but we can give you we can give you an understanding of where you're potentially falling over. We can threshold tests and change the levels slightly to give you a better picture of your product and figure where that shortfall is. And then we can then work with you to then try and help you when you go through the retrofit stage, retest it, and then we can look at it again and try and get you through over those hurdles. And then overall to the qualification piece that I'm sure Graham will probably carry on with this, uh, this question. Yeah, absolutely, Jack. I think that's, that's a fair summation. I think if you fail a test, it isn't a disaster because that's ultimately why we're doing the test. We're doing the test work um, to ensure that the failure doesn't occur in a power station under accident conditions. What we're trying to do is ensure that we generate an environment that's more aggressive than what it would see in service, such that if there is a shortcoming in the design, it happens in a laboratory, not in a station. So it's not a bad thing if it happens. If it does happen, the key thing is quantifying why it's happened and then actually feeding back into some sort of design process. But I think actually, if you have a, a complex test program with lots of different facets and a failure occurs in isolation within one of those facets and it's particularly an isolated component, you may still be able to reuse some of the information and just say that actually, you know, we've exceeded the mechanical load on this particular bracket under seismic conditions, but every other aspect of the test was acceptable. You might not have to go back to square one. We may well be in a situation where we can, you know, we can make use of some of that data. So it's not necessarily a total disaster.